talk, it may not be quite what you expected. It wasn't quite what I expected to write. Um, the reason being that I, I have, in regional terms, well, three main hats by now, or three tin cans tied to my tail, uh, as a result of my work as a, a J British journalist with Seamus Martin in Russia, or the former Soviet Union in the 1990s, um, then uh, for eight years at think tanks in Washington, where I wrote a book about uh, uh, American political culture and its history. Uh, but then before moving to the Soviet Union, as it then was, um, and then again after coming from America, I've concentrated largely on Pakistan and Afghanistan, where I was a journalist for the London Times in the 1980s. And I just came back from Pakistan uh, over the weekend, having previously spent several weeks uh, in Afghanistan. So this has heavily colored my um, thinking at the moment. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me back to the Institute where I've spoken before and also giving me another excuse to visit Dublin where my mother grew up. Uh, although I have to say that as a, <clears throat> what used to be called from a family that used to be called Castle Catholics, she was actually born in another imperial possession, India, uh, where her father was the local district magistrate. So um, possibly better not go into that. But she did grow up in Dublin. Now, this, in this talk, um, it's about Russia and relations with Russia, yes. Uh, but uh, a lot of it won't be about Russia, in fact. Um, Back in the mid-1990s, I, I worked in the Baltic States as, as a journalist during the period when they were getting independence from the Soviet Union. And I was once asked um, what could improve relations, I mean seriously improve relations, between the Latvian and Estonian majority populations and the Russian minorities, or Russian-speaking minorities, um, most of whom, though by no means all, migrated to these regions under Soviet rule. And I replied that, as far as I can see, the only thing that would really improve relations was the appearance of a large Muslim immigrant minority in Latvia and Estonia. That was a joke 20 years ago. It's not a joke anymore. If you look at the reactions in Eastern Europe to even the prospect, even, well, the realistic prospect, of the appearance of considerable numbers of Muslim immigrants. And this is a feature, but a critical feature, of um, the deep and indeed, <clears throat> I would say, existential crisis now facing the West and Western democracy, a crisis to, um, to which Russia is overwhelmingly irrelevant. Uh, Russia is not, in fact, of any great importance in this context whatsoever. Um, and the question then arises why, uh, given that, as far as I can see, this is obvious, and um, this is fact should be obvious to any reasonably well-informed person, our elites persist with such determination uh, in claiming that Russia is um, a mortal threat, or at least a highly important one, and of vast importance to the West. Um, and I would argue um, that uh, this is, in many ways, uh, although I would say generally unconscious rather than conscious, uh, a classic diversionary strategy of which we have seen you know, so much uh, in, uh, in history. Um, I say unconscious rather than conscious, although I'm sure in some cases it is conscious, because it seems to me to relate to a very human very human feature, which is if you're faced with doing something which will be very, very painful and very, very difficult, something which you think you may not in fact have the strength to confront, uh, you know, faced with the need very, very painfully to break up a relationship, what do you do, at least initially? You decide that what's really important is to wash the car. Speaking from my profession of academia, faced with the duty to give a really bad mark to a student, which you know will have a terrible effect on that student's career, you decide that the really important thing is to reshuffle the books in your library. You know, this is a very human thing, as I say. Then again, we do pay our elites you know, to confront the real issues and threats that face our countries. <clears throat> 
So permit me to lay before you the following facts, not opinions, facts. The overwhelming consensus of the scientific community has set a 2% rise in global temperatures as the limit beyond which climate change becomes uncontrollable, uh, with results that it has been widely predicted could bring an end to modern civilization, 2%. Every attempt, every agreement so far aimed at limiting it to 2% has failed, every one internationally. Now, the recent agreement between the Americans and the Chinese could uh, radically change that, but that does depend, amongst many other things, on who wins the elections in November. And if Trump loses in November, a Trump-oid or Trump-id is not going to lose six, uh, four years from now or eight years after that, whereas the threat will continue. Uh, the overwhelming consensus in the scientific community is that even below 2%, there will be profound changes, uh, including to human agriculture in many parts of the world, and that these changes are already apparent um, uh, in, in many places, uh, including most notably in northern India and Pakistan, where approximately 10% of the world's population lives. Uh, in terms of increased drought um, and diminished uh, flow of water from the Himalayas. <clears throat> there is a consensus, for obvious reasons, uh, that one of the principal effects in the medium term, long before you know, we go over 2% and things become really catastrophic, if God forbid they do, uh, one of the effects of this, one of the principal effects, will be greatly to increase migration, obviously. I mean, this is a long-established pattern. Uh, in various parts of the world when the climate changes and when there are severe changes to agriculture. Another fact, obviously, um, that very high levels of migration to Europe already exist. Uh, they were made, of course, even greater and more dramatic over the past two years uh, by refugees fleeing the wars in Syria, Libya, and Afghanistan. Uh, but this is, you know, this latest spike is only a relatively small part, of course, of a much longer and deeper phenomenon. Fact. Over the past 60 years, according to the British census, the Muslim proportion of the British population um, has increased each decade on average by more than 60%. You can look that up if you wish. It takes two clicks of a mouse. Take out a pocket calculator. <coughs> If that continues, if that continues, that proportional increase continues, you have a Muslim majority of the British population by some point in the 2060s. A Muslim majority. That's maths. That ain't pa paranoia. Now, you say, uh, of course, it's wrong, you know, it's always dangerous to extrapolate from the past into the future, etc. Is it really after 60 years of this, six decades, decade on decade? Uh, and in any case, it seems to me that um, the burden of proof is on the people who say, oh, this won't happen, to say why it won't happen, given you know, the patterns we see in the world, um, in the Middle East, uh, the lack of development uh, in even states that remain relatively stable, like Pakistan. And of course, another fact uh, is that such a demographic and cultural transformation has never occurred peacefully or in circumstances of democracy in all of recorded history. It has never occurred. There is no precedent for it occurring in this way. Um, there are precedents, actually, for even higher levels of migration. I come from one of them, Qatar, where the indigenous population has been reduced to about 10%. Qatar, rather notoriously, is not a democracy. And of course, as anyone who has read the papers known, knows, the migrant population is you know, kept in order by extremely rigorous police measures, uh, intended both to exclude them completely from power, but also, of course, to move them on when their work is over. Um, and uh, uh, you may perhaps not have seen this, but. A few months ago, um, the former head of the Equality Commission, who interestingly enough is himself of West Indian origin, he's black, Trevor Phillips, commissioned a poll um, on Muslim integration in Britain, most of the answers uh, of which showed that a around a third um, of the Muslim population was extremely unintegrated into British society in terms of attitudes and culture. Um, 
I was going to discuss this in more depth, but don't have the time. Um, so those are the facts. Question. Historians, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, how will they regard the obsession of Western elites and the Western media with the Russian threat? Um, may it not be rather the way that we regard the European elites before 1914, leading you know, the continent into a catastrophe uh, for reasons which now, of course, they are reconstructed by historians, you know, by people who, like my elder brother, who you know, understand the context of the time. But the automatic response of the average you know, student is, these people must have been mad. You know, why? Why? Why were they obsessed with you know, control over Central Africa or who gets to dominate Bosnia? Well, I would say, actually, that in 1914, by, by the standards of the time, um, uh, this, you know, there were really serious issues involved. German domination of Europe, which, of course, we've ended up with, though by much nicer means. Um, who gets to control Central Europe, the Germans or the Russians, and so forth? These were serious issues. Um, as uh, in um, uh, the 1850s and then again in the late 1870s, between the British Empire and the Russian Empire, the question of who got to control Constantinople, the Straits, and access to the Mediterranean was a really serious issue by the standards of the time. Although, of course, the other thing we need to keep in mind is that the British went to war with Russia once in the 1850s, almost went to war a second time in the 1870s, and as I presume I hardly need to remind an Irish audience, <laughs> went to war again over the Straits in 1915, only that time it was on Russia's side. Um, at Gallipoli, leading to the words of the famous song, it was better to die neath an Irish sky than at Suvla or at Sudelbar. It was indeed. Um, in other words, you know, these apparently, the, the geopolitical agendas which had dominated British thinking for the best part of 100 years were turned around 180 degrees in new circumstances. I would say that the current uh, obsession um, based ultimately on eastern Ukraine uh, is more comparable um, to the Fashoda Institute, uh, incident of 1896, if anyone remembers that, which was basically uh, about whether Britain or France should dominate southern Sudan. Um, fortunately, the British and the French uh, in those days um, you know, were not crazy enough to do that. They realized that there were more important issues concerned. Um, so why, uh, frankly? Um, particularly because... If you look at the epicenter of the problems we're facing at the moment, I mean, I haven't even mentioned this because this is a question for the Americans, not the Europeans, the issue of rising Chinese power in the Far East and whether these islands, you know, or actually not, most of them aren't islands, they're just reefs, are worth fighting over. Um, but as far as we are concerned in Europe, of course, the epicenter of our external problems is obviously the Middle East and North Africa. Well, I mean, the spirit of remembering, you know, the U-turn done by British policy um, from the 19th to the early 20th centuries, um, it's worth remembering two things. Um, the orchestration of hostility to Russia and opposition to Russia has, of course, been focused above all, though by no means exclusively, on NATO. It's worth looking at the record of the past 20 years and asking, in the Middle East, on balance, who's been right? Who's been right in their, their decisions, their actions uh, in the case of the Middle East? Who was right over Iraq? America or Russia? Russia was right, no question about it. Uh, who was, uh, Iraq is a catastrophe. Who was right over Libya? The Russians, of course, abstained under you know, heavy in order to please us. Um, but they abstained on a, a resolution which, of course, was only intended to provide safety um, for the population. The West turned, or some Western countries turned this into bringing down the Gaddafi regime, um, which, of course, Russia was deeply opposed to. Who was right? Look at Libya today. Who was right? And look at the consequences, you know, for uh, migration to Europe. Syria? Well, there are deep divisions on Syria, but I think the ultimate answer is that nobody actually knows what to do. If anyone in this room has an answer to the Syrian crisis, which will establish stability, you know, and peace, Please, I do hope you will put it forward, because I don't know. One thing, though, that we do know, or at least those of us who are paying attention to the issue, uh, is that Russia's support for the Assad regime 
um, as the lesser evil and the only force, the Assyrian army, uh, which in the last resort can prevent the high likelihood of a takeover by ISIS, or if not just by ISIS, by some mixture of Islamist forces, as in Libya. Um, this is a view shared not just by the Russian government, but of course by extensive parts of Western security establishment. So the notion that Russia and us are simply categorically on opposite sides over Syria is nonsense, frankly. Now, so, saying something at lunch over conspiracy theories, um, there have been these suggestions that Russia is somehow deliberately encouraging the refugee flow um, to Europe. Uh, there have even been suggestions. I, I heard from a senior advisor to the British Ministry of Defense over a drink just the other day that he was actually very pleased with Brexit because he thought that this would bring Britain closer to the United States and the United States would then give Britain more in terms of increased British security and so <laughs> forth and so on, just as it has done over the past 15 years. Um, at the same time, however, he suggested that Putin had been secretly funding uh, not just the Brexit camp, UKIP in Britain, uh, but also the Scottish nationalists in order to, um, to break up Britain, something for which, of course, there is not a shred of truth. As for orchestrating the refugee crisis, well, you all know, I mean, the Syrian you know, war began before Russia took a hand, and the flow of refugees or migrants to Europe via Russia is a tiny, tiny fraction of the ones who have been coming either through Turkey, a member of NATO and a prospective member of the European Union, or through Libya, a state which we contributed heavily to destroying. I first got a sense of just how bad this was. In the, the late um, 1990s, connected with the tragic loss of the ferry Estonia, in the Baltic in 1994, a few years earlier. A very senior British journalist working for what is generally regarded as the most intellectual and serious of the British daily newspapers, known to both Seamus and myself, came to me in a high state of excitement when I was working for the Institute for Strategic Studies in London, saying that he had heard from what he described as well-informed sources, one presumes in some intelligence service or another, though he wouldn't say, um, uh, that um, there was a, a really strong um, evidence uh, that a Russian submarine had torpedoed the Estonia uh, because uh, it was, uh, there was a, a spy on board who was carrying, um, I think he said, the whole bloody torpedo, the, this famous um, mythical monster, the Schwal torpedo, which is supposed to travel at hundreds of miles an hour and fly and brush its teeth and all these things. And this was being transported in the Estonia to the west, and so the Russians torpedoed it. And I said, um, you know that uh, a, a torpedo makes a large hole in the side of a ship, and the Estonia's bows came off. And you know you've had investigations, divers gone down from the. You know. So you'd have to suggest, uh, quite apart from the testimony of the survivors, um, you'd have to suggest a giant conspiracy involving the Swedish and the Finnish governments, which allowed them, you know, to, um, you know, uh, rig the entire investigation, but also somehow thereafter to prevent any other divers going down and um, exploring the hole and where it was and so forth, you know, point being that the divers had established that, yes, indeed, the doors came off in a storm, and there was no evidence of, a, of a, a torpedo or an explosion. And then a light came into his eyes, you know, that I've seen in so many places, you know, Russia, you know, uh, above all. Um, I remember a senior Russian journalist, his equivalent in many ways, explaining to me how America had actually been behind the terrorist attacks in Mumbai in 2008 in order to draw India into an American alliance, you know, and you get that light. And he said, ah, oh, he said, but might the Russian submarine not have rammed the ship and knocked its bows off? I don't know if there are any submariners or sailors or anything, but I presume I don't need to explain why this would not really work, or at least uh, not without the loss of the submarine as well. But this guy thought this was a serious proposition. And at that moment, a phrase came back to me from the days of the Vietnam War, an adaptation, you remember, of a famous saying of an American admiral in a battle with the British. We have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> 
In other words, you know, we are producing, some of us are producing, conspiracy theories you know, as a mirror of what used to be Soviet propaganda. We are still trapped, in not, you know, not in uh, an attempt uh, to understand uh, issues with Russia um, from the point of view of any kind of um, objectivity, but essentially in propaganda and counter-propaganda to many of us, which with at the wilder fringes, of course, insane conspiracy theories. Yeah. Now, <coughs> coming to what I suppose should have been the main uh, issue, uh, and, and you know, the, the general point of this being that we're going to hear again, you know, from the Warsaw Summit uh, statements, you know, that the Pentagon considering Russia the greatest threat now to uh, America and American interests. Really, in a world that includes the Islamic State, uh, you know, this British general Seamus and I were talking about it. Um, uh, on the record, of course, of a series of brilliant British military successes over the past 15 years, um, look, you know, writing this book saying that you know, there's going to be a third world war because Russia invades the Baltic states. Why? Why? Well, I think, you see, the answer is summed up in a phrase from Charles Tilley, the sociological historian, residual elites. Um, we have inherited from the Cold War, I say we, I'm talking the British here, you know, Ireland was not in NATO. But we have, we have inherited elites who were created to a great extent, calibrated over many decades to resist a power based in Moscow, one. And they're still at it. It is much too difficult for them to confront these infinitely more difficult challenges, uh, to which, indeed, there are no easy solutions. There may be no solutions at all. Um, but certainly, whatever they are, uh, they are problems for which NATO uh, is totally, totally uh, unadapted to, um, to, to confront. And, of course, the other great thing, the wonderful thing about confronting Russia, unlike confronting ISIS, is that as throughout the whole of NATO's history during the Cold War, you don't have to fight. You're a military alliance, but you don't have to fight. The one thing that was made categorically clear, first during the Georgia War in 2008, and again since the Ukrainian crisis first erupted, was that whatever happened, whatever promises had been made, whatever grand statements had been issued, there was no question whatsoever of NATO actually going to war with Russia in Georgia or Ukraine. And that is in part, um, for just obvious reasons of the real risks and real interests involved, but there's also a damn good democratic reason for it. Western electorates would never stand for it. The Dutch have just represent, you know, shown that in their own referendum on Ukraine. So you see, the wonderful thing is it's perfect for NATO. It is perfect for NATO. On the one hand, it's what they were created to do. And on the other hand, you don't actually have to fight, something which NATO has proved extremely bad at you know, over the past 15 years, is fighting. It couldn't be better from their point of view. Now, in terms of the specific Ukrainian crisis, point one, uh, this is happening on the river Danyet, which is a tributary of the Don. It isn't happening on the Elbe. It isn't happening on the Rhine. This is where, 26 years ago or more, until the beginning of the Soviet withdrawal from um, Eastern Europe, this is where the crisis was supposed to happen, remember. 30 years ago, people like General Sheriff, of course, were writing about the Third World War, beginning with Soviet tank armies coming across the Fulda Gap into West Germany on their way to France and Belgium and Britain and Ireland and wherever. Now, this is happening on the borders of Russia, more than 1,000 miles to the east, you know, in an area where the great majority speaks Russian. I'll come back to the specific legitimacy of the Donbass in the end, I mean, and whose territory it was. In other words, if there is one thing which is glaringly obvious, is that without justifying some of the Russian actions or reactions, which have indeed uh, been uh, on occasions not just illegal, um, and immoral, 
but politically wrong, and actually contrary to Russia's own interests in particular cases. Nonetheless, it is perfectly obvious that viewed over the past generation, Russia has been on the defensive strategically, not on the offensive, and it is the West which has been on the offensive geopolitically, and not the reverse. Um, second point, uh, we have expected Russia to play by the rules of the European Union. Problem, Russia is not a member of the European Union and never will be. Uh, Russia, therefore, feels entirely justified in playing by the general rules of international great power politics uh, and therefore draws attention, not without reason, to the record in this regard of the United States, of China, of Turkey, and so on in their regions. Um, final point uh, in Ukraine. Russia initiated the present crisis, not, of course, deliberately, but by trying to essentially bribe Ukraine, or the Ukrainian government, into membership of the Eurasian Union. Now, the Eurasian Union is the absolute centerpiece of Russia's international strategy. This was the attempt of the Russian government to create an economic and political bloc around itself. Not a recreation of the Soviet Union. This was never going to lead to another you know, Soviet army. It was never going to lead to a tight you know, administrative state. But it was you know, their hope to create a bloc which would guarantee Russian exports, um, you know, thereby helping to preserve uh, the Russian industry, and would give some chance, however pathetic, of maintaining Moscow as a world pole, as a great power, uh, if not equal to Washington and Beijing, you know, at least up there with the Indians as one of the poles. Now, and, and it, was the Ukra it was the Ukrainian government's agreement to that, the European Union's challenge to it by the offer of an association agreement, um, the reaction of many Ukrainians against uh, membership of this Russian-dominated bloc, which set off the whole crisis. Now, without going into the details of what happened on the ground, which, of course, are greatly contested, I would just like to point out that on the most important point, Russia has lost and lost permanently. Whatever happens, whatever happens, Ukraine as a whole is not going to come into any version of the Eurasian Union. That's over. On the other hand, it should be absolutely apparent by now that there is no chance whatsoever of Ukraine in any foreseeable age of the world joining the European Union. That's out, because the European Union is in far, far too much trouble to be able to do that. Uh, so we are left with a Ukraine, as it was before, lying between the West and Russia, uh, for which we need to find some kind of local solution. Because this has been a Ukrainian crisis. It is not about a threat to invade Poland or the Baltic states. Look at the importance of Ukraine to Russia. You do not need to posit wider Russian agendas. The agenda is Ukraine, and it's an agenda which, on balance, they've lost. Final thing, I always like to, you know, having been fairly gloomy, uh, to throw in a more positive note. Um, and uh, you know, part of the problem at the moment is that the Ukrainian government seems is just too weak. The Ukrainian polity is too divided, apart from anything else, as well as, of course, strong nationalist sentiments, to put into effect the terms of the Minsk Agreement, which, of course, called for constitutional change in Ukraine and a federal system, including some special autonomous status for the Donbass. Well, now, the thing about the Donbass is that uh, it is not, whatever the Ukrainians may say, sacred soil of Ukraine. Uh, at least Donetsk isn't, and it isn't the sacred soil of Russia. It is, in fact, the sacred soil of Wales. I don't know if any of you know the original name of Donetsk before the Soviets renamed it. Yusupka, which comes from Mr. Thomas Hughes. So my solution is that, obviously, uh, it should be renamed Yusupka, like so many of these Ukrainian places which had names given to them over the years, and it should be given back to the Hughes family for them to decide. Now, if, as I confidently expect, the Hughes family turns it down, it should be given to the family um, that sold uh, the area of what is now Donetsk to the Hughes family, and the name of that family was Levin. <laughs> that would be me. That was my great-grandfather uh, who sold it in order to concentrate his property back in the Baltic provinces, which didn't work either, but that's another story. Um, and so you give it back to, um, I, I'll, I'll be the agent of the Levin family, and you hold a referendum. 
We're all Democrats, right, more or less. You hold a referendum in the Donbass. Uh, Seamus, you know, who's been a, an election observer for the OSC, goes out as chief election observer, and you hold a referendum on where the population of the Donbass should go. This is the only democratic solution. And you have, in order, you, you have obviously, the obvious choice of, of places. You have, do you want to remain in Ukraine? Do you want to join Russia? Do you want to be an independent state of the Donbass? Uh, or do you want to join Wales? I have no doubt whatsoever what the democratic answer of the population would be. Thank you. Thank you.